Hello and welcome again to What If Natives One, a video blogging channel about alternate history and American Indians, Native Americans, Indigenous peoples. This is the 18th video of 28 Planned Ones. My name is Al Carroll. I'm Associate Professor of History at Northern Virginia Community College. I've written mostly about wars, veterans, human rights, and genocide. I'm also, together with Rob Schmidt of Bluecorn Comics, editing and putting out a short story collection, What If Natives Won. This is what this video blog and channel are about. There's a huge lack of alternate history written about American Indians, indigenous people. Many people don't like to think about genocides in America. They likely were never taught about them. Many don't want to be reminded, want to believe these genocides never happened or it was an accident. I've had great success using alternate history to teach my students, show them that absolutely nothing in history was inevitable. It never had to be. The worst of human history is always a conscious choice. How things turn out is based on how evil the evil choose to be and how well and how strongly good people choose to stand up to them or stop them. The way things turned out in history took a very specific set of circumstances. Sometimes history can turn on very small things. Change even one and you have an entirely different history, different present, different society. It may be hard to hear this, but we live right now in a dystopian world, one of the worst of all possible outcomes for anyone who is not white. America is today 98% non-native. At least 75 million to 112 million natives were killed by not one genocide, but a series of them. These many genocides, the last of them ended only in the year 2000 in Peru, and many more took place in America, Brazil, Canada, Guatemala, Argentina, and Mexico. On top of that is massive genocide denial. This is not taught in almost all America's schools, and there are racist images everywhere that are often not admitted to be racist. But so much of this could change if the Trail of Tears is stopped. Most Americans know a small amount about this, but they typically were not taught in public schools that this was ethnic cleansing. Many also don't know how close it came to never happening. The Trail of Tears was almost entirely caused by Indian hater Andrew Jackson, the most viciously racist of all U.S. presidents, along with Andrew Johnson and Trump. The so-called five civilized tribes all took on parts of Anglo-American culture, literacy, capitalism, Christianity, even planta plantation slavery, and with that, sometimes anti-black racism. Except for the Seminoles and the Red Stick faction among the Muscogee, they avoided warfare with the U.S. Mostly they did this in hope of avoiding losing their lands or being wiped out. Some did have an ugly self-hatred of being native. Andrew Jackson was called Chula Harjo, or Old Crazy, to the Muscogee. To the Choctaw, he was devil. His army took Muscogee skin to make reins and boots for Jackson's cavalry. Jackson even took a Choctaw orphan as a pet for his son after murdering his whole village. He tried to steal two million acres from Cherokee, but only t successfully took 45,000 acres. He ran the campaign promise, vote yourself a farm, meaning vote for me and I'll steal native land for you. The Choctaw lost one third of, the, of their tribe on their trail of tears. They remember it as the walk of angels or the blood moon. Muscogee people were marched in handcuffs in the show, in the snow, and cholera and dysentery killed 3,000 of them. The Chickasaw lost 500 to dysentery and smallpox. But about half of all white Americans opposed the Trail of Tears, especially concerning the Cherokee. Americans defending the five tribes included Quakers, Baptists, abolitionists, and what became the Whig Party. One million white Americans signed petitions against Indian removal, one-fifth of the adult white, population, white male population. Davy Crockett called removal a wicked, unjust measure, oppression with a vengeance. Sam Houston, also known as Blackbird, had lived with, fought alongside, and married into the Cherokee, and strongly opposed their removal. President John Q. Adams called removal infamous, bringing eternal disgrace upon this country. Supreme Court Justice John Marshall in Georgia v. Worcester decision, said Indian tribes were distinct, independent political communities, retained their original natural rights as undisputed possessors of the soil from time immemorial. Most impressive of all was Senator Theodore Frelinghuysen, who gave a six-hour speech in the Cherokee defense on the floor of the U.S. Senate. To stop this, the Cherokee had passed a law requiring 80% of the tribe to vote to sell Cherokee land. No individual Cherokee could sell Cherokee land. But the pro 
removal faction, the pro-slavery faction among the Cherokee, was led by Stan Wadey, John Ridge, and Elias Boudinot. And they all had a self-hatred of being Cherokee. Boudinot said Cherokee were a people tending to immorality and debasement. The final destiny of our people must be downward until it, become, it becomes extinct or is merged with another race. These three men led just 75 Cherokee, and they signed a fraudulent treaty claiming to represent all Cherokee. For this, they were exempt from land seizure, and they left in comfort. 15,000 of the remaining 16,000 Cherokees signed a petition opposing the fraudulent treaty. For their actions, Boudinot and Ridge were executed as traitors. Stan Wadey escaped, and during the Civil War, he led a faction of Confederate Cherokee that were responsible for up to 6,000 Cherokee deaths. So, the trail where we cried began, going from Georgia to Oklahoma. Up to 8,000 Cherokee died on the Trail of Tears. The treaty claimed that there would be steamboats, baggage wagons, and doctors provided for them, that their property would be defended. But white, white Georgians looted and seized Cherokee property, even robbing graves. U.S. troops stood by and let it happen. Cherokee families were divided, with 1,200 Cherokee children made into orphans. 7,000 American troops herded Cherokee into 23 concentration camps. The delay of three months while rounding up all the Cherokee brought measles, pleurisy, and whooping cough, killing large numbers of them. The march to Oklahoma lasted 150 days. In Congress, the forced removal had failed by two votes in committee, and then by a vote of 102 to 97 in the general vote. What is just as important about the details of the, Trails of Tear, of the Trail of Tears is how preventable it always was. Almost half of all white Americans strongly opposed it. Every president before Jackson opposed forcing peaceful tribes off their land. Some members of the federal government even proposed giving natives their own state or states and voting rights. Some founders like Ben Franklin were great admirers and tried to bring native philosophy into American government. There is not just one way to stop this ethnic cleansing. There are many. This would not happen almost any other, uh, under almost any other potential president, only Jackson. If Jackson had been killed young or died of illness, if he had been killed in the Creek War against the Red Sticks, uh, Juno Luska, a Cherokee leader, had personally saved Jackson's life and regretted it once his people were betrayed and forcibly removed. The most obvious way he could die is by duels. Jackson is often falsely claimed to have fought over a hundred duels, but most duels were just verbal challenges where no one actually fought. But in the most serious actual duel, both Jackson and Charles Dickinson shot each other. Dickinson's bullet landed near Jackson's heart. Jackson, in turn, shot Dickinson in the crotch, not in the head as shown in many sketches. If there is no Jackson, the five tribes have the same fate as the six nations of the Iroquois. They lose most of their land, but not all of it, and gradually. Some flee elsewhere. For the Iroquois, this was into Canada. But most Iroquois today still live in their homelands, many of them very prosperous. Another way this ethnic cleansing can be prevented is if Congress goes against Jackson. In our own time, the vote in, co uh, in committee only passed by two votes. The vote in the House by five votes. The soon-to-be Whig Party recognized him as a potential dictator. Just a few congressmen could halt forced removal of the Cherokee. Would Jackson listen to Congress? Famously, he did not listen to the Supreme Court. If he ignores them, what can Congress do? Cut the budget to the military, as Congress did to Nixon over Vietnam. Censor him, which he would likely ignore. Finally, they impeach him. An impeachment back then is more likely to pass uh, than it did against Nixon or Trump. The presidency did not yet have the same power as it does today. Most early presidents followed what Congress did, except for Jackson. Impeachment has a good chance of passing both houses and convicting him. But then who would remove him? Chances are Jackson refuses to leave office. The army is under his command. Who would it side with? In 1831, General Winfield Scott is senior military commander. Scott had a long time disdain for Jackson. He was the Whig Party for can a candidate for president in 1852, the party opposed to Jackson. Scott would happily remove Jackson from office. But still, Jackson is enormously popular among many soldiers and half the public. Jackson can rally many to his side. Some state militias like Georgia and Tennessee likely take Jackson's side. This means a civil war. 
mostly north that opposed Jackson versus south and west that supported Jackson. West at this time meant states along the Mississippi, what is today called the Midwest. How does the Civil War of 1832 go? There is an election coming up. It's possible Jackson's militias overwhelm the U.S. Army and occupy the Northeast, where Jackson is least popular. What you have is almost a reverse of the Civil War in our own time. The Civil War in our own time lasted so long mostly because of the size of the South and being protected by mountains. For the Northeast, the mountains also protect, but it's much smaller in size. This US, the U.S. Army in 1831 or 1832 was under 10,000 and about to fight the Black Hawk War in Iowa and Illinois. The first secession crisis was only months away in South Carolina. The second Seminole War was three years away. All these could complicate this civil war. Perhaps Jackson backs down over tariffs, or he crushes any dissent. What a Jackson victory means is the first U.S. military dictatorship. Jackson could remain dictator until his death in 1845. For natives, Mexico, the U.S., and the world, this is far worse. He likely carries out his ethnic cleansing more brutally. In our own time, he also tried to provoke war with France, only to be blocked by Congress. Congress no longer exists exist except as his rubber stamp. France's navy could easily ravage the U.S. Navy, shipping, and coast, and war would sidetrack France's attempted revolution. Mexico's government at that time was made up of elitist conservatives fighting among themselves. A war with Mexico would be followed by the same ethnic cleansing of natives and Mexicans that Texas insurgents did. But it's also true that U.S. militias did very poorly against the British in 1812. They lost almost all battles and were repeatedly humiliated, often fleeing literally at the first shot. South Carolina, in its secession crisis, only a year away, backed down very easily. This early civil war could be closer to the Whiskey Rebellion. Jackson supporters could just be scattered protest, crushed by a professional army easily. If secession is crushed easily at the start, any future civil war will end far quicker if it even starts. The U.S. Army in 1830 was under 10,000 and about to fight a Black Hawk War. The Second Civil war, Seminole War was three years away. All these could complicate enforcing impeachment. More likely, the U.S. agrees to keep the large Seminole Reservation. Both the Cherokee and Seminole deaths from ethnic cleansing are stopped. Over 8,000 native deaths avoided. Two large native nations keep their homelands. That counts as a limited native victory. A U.S. public that sympathized and mobilized to prevent forced removal, and likely will again, will again, is a greater victory. This is the end of the 18th video. I look forward to your comments and questions and will answer them as often as I can. Racism, genocide, denial, childish behavior, personal attacks get deleted. But I do recognize some questions will be asked in ignorance because much of the facts I point to are new to most people. They were never taught about this. They've been raised in denial since denying indigenous genocides is taught in almost all public schools. Next time we will discuss what if Americans lose in Texas. Please repost freely, subscribe, like, share, and comment. I'll post again in about a week. This has been What If Natives 1 video blog and channel.